ProWrestlingTees.com slash 616 Entertainment is the home of all official 616 Entertainment merchandise. Pick up a shirt, you'll be glad you did. This video is also brought to you in part by the Patreon producers, without whom content like this would not be possible. Oh my goodness, Dan Dans, you guys have been asking for this for a long time, for some reason. Uh, <laughs> so, ask and you shall receive. I will continue reading the horrible Mortal Kombat novel by Jeff Roven that was released in fucking, I don't know man, I got it right here. Holding it in my hands, it was released in 1992, I am holding a Boulevard edition of this novel. Actually, you know what? It was released in 1995. The Mortal Kombat trademark was created in 1992. If you don't have any idea what's going on, in season one of Mortal Kombat Monday, I started reading this Mortal Kombat novel. There are several entries of me reading it. I do a couple chapters at a time. Uh, I do silly voices as I read through it. The writing in this book is not good. And we just have a good time with it. I stumble on my words. I get to sentences that are so long. I'm like, I can't believe this is a published novel. I should publish a novel if it's this easy. But it's time to uh, it's time to continue. I'm looking at the pages of this book, and it looks like we're about halfway through. And before we even get into it, I want to say a sh I want to give a special shout out to my buddy Handy Dandy Andy Jarek because he is the one who gave me this book. He bought it for like two bucks at a used bookstore and then uh, he read it and he texted me one day and he said, I bought this Mortal Kombat book. It sucks. You'll love it. <laughs> it was something like that. And he just gave it to me. So here we are. We are jumping into chapter 15. If you want to catch up on chapters 1 through 14, links to all of them. All of those parts are in the description. It's going to take you hours and hours to get through that. And you know what? When I'm done with the whole book, I will release probably like a six, seven, eight hour complete reading of the whole book. And we can call it the worst audio book of all time. So I don't remember what any of my voices sounded like for these characters. So we're just going to free ball it and guess. Here we are. It's page 125, chapter 15. How many of you are ASMR people? You like that page turning? I fucking hate ASMR. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Here we are. The towering skyscrapers glowed in the sunset. Office windows were still lighted. And in the streets below, traffic crawled and horns squawked as some workers left the great city. To the sides, business people and tourists, shoppers and street vendors, the homeless and the prosperous all moved in a writhing, fractal-like mass. And then, a single bolt of lightning tore through the sky, faster and larger and longer lived than any of the people had ever seen. There, we are three sentences in, and there's a fuck-up. And then a single bolt of lightning tore through the sky, faster and larger and longer lived than any of the people had ever seen. I read it twice. It's a typo. I didn't fuck up. I'm looking right at it. This didn't take long. An instant later, thunder rolled through the deep stone and steel valleys of the city, reaching even to the basements and subways of the great metropolis. People were still for a moment, and because they were all so silent, they heard the other roar. It came from the sea, the ground-shaking rumble of an ocean pouring in on itself, over and over, accompanied by the roar of the wind. Those nearest the harbor saw it first, the waves nearly touching the clouds, the fierce winds teeming sheets of spray from their crests, freighters and tankers, yachts and tugboats, ocean liners and sailboats tossed and spun, one against the other as the flood moved inexorably forward. This fucking guy, Jeff Rovin, it's all coming back to me. Why does he always do this? This and that, and this and that. And this and that. He's done it twice already. We're two pages into chapter 15. The waters along the shoreline vanished as they were sucked into the onrushing wave, and then it smashed down on the city, turning brick to dust, steel girders to twizzlers, people to corpses, extinguishing a city and its suburbs and the lives of over 10 million people. 
Liu Kang woke with a jolt. He was breathing heavily and perspiring, and he looked around to get his bearings, his dark eyes moist with tears. Another dream, he thought. Won't there ever be an end? At least he hadn't cried out. He looked at the other two members of the White Lotus Society who were sharing his tent. They were still asleep, soundly so. He did not envy Guy Lai or Wilson Tong much in this life. Did not envy anyone, for that matter. But he wished, like them, that he could get through one night without these dreams of Armageddon. He drew a throwing... Take two. He drew a throwing star from his belt and played with it in one hand, as though it were a coin. That always calmed him. Fucking weirdo. Yet, it was through dreams that he learned whether he was needed, and if so, where. They were... Take two. See, when I fuck up, I'll own it. I'll just say take two and take it again. They were the means through which the gods spoke to him. If only they would... If only they would deign to speak every other night, Liu Kang thought. I don't know what deign means. I've never heard that fucking word before. He ran a towel across his brow. One that kept his beside his bedroll for just this purpose. After rubbing it along the sweaty ends of his brown hair... Lou pressed a button on his watch and the small light went on. 10.30. He'd only been asleep for an hour. Not only were the dreams more frequent, they were coming earlier in the night. With a yawn, he lay back down. Holding his wrist directly above his face, he pressed a second button. The two began to glow, and he smiled. It was fitting that this was the direction his ally had gone, for they were a team. Perhaps one of the most unusual and daring duos in his entire history of crime fighting. He pushed the button to shut off the number. Then he turned on his side, still smiling. When he was born in China 24 years before, the son of poor Li and Lin Kang, Lu was never expected to be anything more than a carpenter, like his father. But as a boy, he became fascinated with the Order of Light. And under the tutelage of a patient and caring priest named Kung Lao, he studied the ancient texts and learned the ways of good and righteousness. And then there were that beggar... Take two. And then there was that beggar who took him under his wing. Liu Kang had never told his parents about him, for surely they would not have approved. But his bigger take two. But his beggar came to the temple each day and, in the hidden inner courtyard, taught him the ways of the martial arts. Kung Lao had always hoped that Liu would stay and become a priest, but the young man had other ideas. In dreams, and in the graphic sketches he worked on for his own pleasure, he saw the villains in societies that made an agony of people's lives, and began to wonder if there might be something he could do to help them. Armed with his learning and skills, he worked his way across the sea to the United States, where he joined the White Lotus Society, a band of reformed criminals, Chinese expatriates, and moonlighting men and women from every walk of life. Their goal was to work within the law, but outside the courts to catch criminals red-handed and see that justice was done. And though publicly Kung Lao had expressed his displeasure at Liu Kang, taking his knowledge from Chu Zheng, Liu always felt the master was secretly pleased that he was trying to make the world a better place. Now Liu was back in China, on the trail of not one but two of the most notorious villains in the world. One was Kano, who had finally slithered out of hiding, and mighty finally be caught- what? One was Kano, who had finally slithered out of hiding and mighty finally be caught committing a criminal- This is supposed to say might. I'm going to read that as, as, as if it says might and not mighty and it'll make sense. Two typos. One was Kano, who had finally slithered out of hiding and might finally be caught committing a criminal act of some kind. To stop that man and members of the Black Dragon Society would be a triumph indeed. The other villain, Shang Tsung, was a different matter altogether. The mysterious figure lived on an island in the East China Sea, where he was known to host a secret tournament known as Mortal Kombat. There was nothing illegal about that, though it was rumored that people died during the contest. But in dreams, in vague images, Liu had been warned that Shang Tsung was the one behind Kano's latest venture. What they were planning was considerable... Take two. What they were planning was of considerable importance to both the White Lotus Society and the U.S. Special Forces, a covert team of highly trained operatives. Liu had discovered the whereabouts of Kano, but was unable to plan an agent on his team of cutthroats. There was an agent who was at 2 o'clock on the watch dial, 
an agent whose job was to make sure that no one died. Unless it was one of the Black Dragons. That agent was a U.S. operative by the name of Sonya Blade. So that's chapter 15. Now, some of you may not have even made it through that chapter. And that's okay, but that's what this is, man. We're, we're fucking, we're reading a book. This is Mortal Kombat Monday. We're reading a book. <laughs> that one didn't really have any voices for me to do. It was all exposition. So this one, here we go. I flipped some pages. We've got some voices here. So it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna fucking tick up a little bit. Let me check the time. God damn, it took me 10 minutes to read that chapter. <laughs> chapter 16. It had been a close one, but Sonya had been prepared to act. Though her orders were that she had let... Take two. Though her orders were that she let Kano lead her to Shang Tsung, she would have taken him and Moriarty out before she'd let the shepherd die. Colin Moriarty? Fortunately, Kung Lao had capitulated... Capitulated, and the crisis had been averted. That's one of my favorite phrases. She wouldn't be able to keep herself on playing... What the fuck? My nose is itchy. <laughs> this is the stuff that when, like, I'm reading the the script that I wrote for, like, Triangle like Squir Squared Circle or A History Of, every time I fuck up, I cut it out, and you guys don't hear it. But I'm not cutting this shit out. This is the worst audiobook ever. Fortunately, Kung Lao had capitulated and the crisis had been averted. She would be able to keep on playing the role she had created for herself, that of master criminal Gilda Stahl. She'd looked at the frightened faces of villagers peering from dark windows as they walked through Wuhu, saw how they feared for the well-being of Kung Lao, saw how important he was to them. She wondered if there was a greater feeling one could have than affecting so many lives in such a positive way. Kung Lao had taken the band to the temple, where he had shown them to a great library in the center of the centuries-old structure. There, Kano had tied a leather strap around Shepard's neck and then attached it to Moriarty's neck, with instructions to waste the boy if Kung Lao did anything shady. If this operation goes smooth, Kano had said to the priest, everyone lives. If not, then the flockmeister buys a toot suite in some other village and gets to wear the leash. We got a radio here, and I can stay in touch with whoever I leave behind. Capiche? I spelled capiche wrong. Kung Lao said that he understood and promised. He understood and promised Kano that there would be no trouble, though he urged him to consider carefully what he was proposing to do. What you plan, said the priest, will help to make Shang Tsung the most powerful mortal on Earth. Worse than that, I fear it will help to pave the way for the coming of one of the most powerful immortals off Earth, the foul Shao Kahn and his demonic hordes. You drivel too much, Kano answered with his usual keen insight. Clam up and tell me about Mount Ifakube. <laughs> I had to stop and read that and make sure I didn't fuck it up. And then Kung Lao had taken a lantern and gone up a spiral stairwell to the balcony of scrolls that surrounded it. While he looked through the manuscripts in plain view of the gang leader, the rest of them sat on a mat in the center of the floor, getting ready to eat a meal that was brought in by monks. Before eating the broth that had been served to him, Kano had made Chin Chin try it. The boy raised the bowl to his lips and sipped. How'd you feel? Kano said, eyeing the lad as he put the bowl down. Warmer, the boy admitted. The broth is very hot. I don't mean that, you rube. I mean, is it poisoned? No, sir, the boy said. Nodding, Kano took the plain, white, glazed ceramic bowl and drank heartily. Unless, Chin Chin said, the cook used the slow-acting Twire root, in which case we will not know until morning. Kano's red eye fastened on the boy like a laser beam. He stopped drinking. Are you joking? No, sir, said the boy, genuinely frightened. I, I am merely answering your question. Kano twisted toward Kung Lao. Hey, preacher man, he said. Would any of your boys be stupid enough to try and poison me? Kung Lao said. Oh, fuck, I, the, I was going to use the voice that I used for the priest for Kung Lao. What did Kung Lao sound like in the new movie? I don't know. We teach here that whoever corrupt the, the indiv... Take two. We teach here that whoever corrupt the individual, murder is wrong. Within these walls, you needn't fear any danger. Not for many of us, certainly. The priest's eyes seemed to linger on Sonya, 
though she wondered if she only imagined it. He couldn't possibly know who she was or why she was here. Only Liu Kang and her superior at the Special Forces, Colonel David George, knew her mission. Kano considered what Kung Lao had said, and then nodded. That's a good rule. Keep the scrolls from getting perforated with the bullets that missed the cook. I was all set to go out and make myself hurl. Not that this soup doesn't taste like it's poison. What's it seasoned with, yak fur? Pheasant Bill, said Kung Lao. When we are forced to kill life to sustain our own, we see it that nothing goes to waste. We use the feathers to stuff our pillows, the talons to make writing imple. Hey, that's great, Kano said. Real interesting. Now how about the map of the road to Ifakube? It's coming, Kung Lao said. Schneider snorted into his broth. What the fuck does Schneider sound like? <laughs> Let's give him a silly voice. Sounds like a Bob Hope movie. He's... <laughs> One of the ones he made with Bing Crosby and Dorothy Lamour. Zip it, Schneids, Kano hissed. Let the holy moly concentrate on doing his job. I wasn't talking to him. I don't care who you was talking to, Schneids. It's distracting. How about you both shut up, Moriarty said. Wait, Moriarty needs a better voice than that. What does Moriarty sound like? <laughs> How about you both shut up, Moriarty said. <laughs> Yeah, no, he'll be he'll be he'll be like a stereotypical gangster. How about you both shut up, Warrior? He said. Yeah, even though it's an Irish name, yelling to be heard over the sounds of the Walkman plugged in his ears. I can't hear my damn tunes. Kano fired eye daggers at him and then at Schneider. Both men fell silent as the leader brought the soup bowl to his lips. While the men had argued, Sonia had suddenly become aware that the priest was staring at her, and as he did, she could feel something pass between them. Something intangible, whatever it was. She felt as if he were inside her brain, searching for something. And when he seemed to find it, his eyes smiled and returned at his scroll. Here it is, Kung Lao said as he stared down at the steps. The map you requested. Mount Ifukube is now known as Mount Angelus. Mount Angelus, I don't know what the fuck. A-N-G-I-L-A-S? Mount Angelus, named after the archaeologist who did many of the excavations of the caves at the turn of the century. Thanks for the history lesson, Kano said. Why don't you go... Take two. Why don't you go get yourself some shoes while we finish eating? I want to go out as soon as we're done. But this is not a path to be traveled in the dark, Kung Lao said. There are many dangers. Don't worry, Kano said. We got flashlights and many guns. We'll be fine. Kung Lao said, The dangers I speak of are not of this world. You are venturing into the realm of the gods. Now, uh, now it sounds like a Steve Reeves movie, Schneider said. Or Jason in the Argonauts. Ever see that? I have, Schneider. I used to love that movie growing up. Shout out to Ray Harryhausen. Yeah, Kano said. And for once, I agree with you. Let's get a move on. Finishing his broth and rising, he said, Moriarty, give Schneider the MK. You'll stay here with Senny. One up, Link Yak. What? You'll stay here with Senny. One up, Link Yaka, the carbine, and a whole lot of shells. Anything happens to us, you guys turn woohoo into a used people lot. Gotcha, Moriarty said, giving the weapon to Schneider and taking the satellite linked telephone from Jim Wu. Who the fuck is Jim Wu? <laughs> Kano took a deep breath and and looked at Kung Lao. Nobody's getting any younger, monk master. How about we move it out? Kung Lao rang a bell, and when one of the monks appeared, the priest asked him for his hat and a pouch for the scroll. When the monk brought the items, Kung Lao carefully placed the rolled map inside the ox skin pouch and slung it over his shoulder. He donned the pointed cap, smiled benignly at Chin Chin, then walked, still barefoot and wearing only his robe, into the cool night. Behind him, in a row, were Kano, with his knife drawn, Schneider, with the M44 tucked under his arm, Jim Wu, with the backpack containing the rest of their food in the second of the telephones, and Sonya Blade, who had her hand on the knife with the electric bug in its hilt, and her eyes on the priest, who was far more than he seemed to be. That's chapter 16 for you. Let me check the battery on the recorder here because I know we were running low before. 19 minutes, brother. Let's keep going. Chapter 17. Are you sure, Shang Tsung howled. Are you very sure, Ruth A? 
you don't know who Ruth A is, you gotta go back and fucking listen to the other ones. I don't remember who Ruth A is or what the voice I did for them was. Is, is Ruth A like a demon? What fuck? I don't know. The tortured voice of the demonic regent rose from the circular streak on the floor. So it's a tor- it's a demonic regent. I don't even know what a regent is. So is it like a regenerated person? What would that sound like? Let's let's give it like a like an Igor like style voice. I am certain an ancient enemy has reached out to a new ally in dreams. In dreams, Shang Tsung. Who is this ancient enemy? Shang Tsung asked, even though he knew what the answer would be. The long imprisoned devil wailed, wailed, "Our foe is the obscene Thunderlord Raiden, who, like our great Lord Shao Kahn." Is a child of the be take two. Is a child of the original being. It cannot be, Shang Tsung snarled. Why has Raiden returned after all these years? Fuck, that just sounds like Kung Lao. But I can't how can I possibly do a Kari Hiroyuki Tagawa impression? What does Shang Tsung sound like? In Mortal Kombat 9, uh he had like a much more traditional, like older Chinese guy voice, right? I don't really remember what he sounded like, though. I'm just gonna keep doing what I do. <laughs> I fear, Shang Tsung, that he never left! It was he who tutored Kung Lao the first, the maker of the amulet you seek. I sense that he has always been among us, manipulating events in secret. Why? To protect the amulet? In part, yes. Why didn't he just destroy it? He cannot, Ruthie said. What was forged by God and given to mortal cannot be retrieved. The wizard's fingers curled into a tight ball and he rattled it at the side of the ooze-covered powder on the floor of the shrine. I haven't come this far to be stopped by a mortal, even a mortal who was aided by a deity. Then you must act against Lu. <laughs> this is so stupid. <laughs> I hope you guys are having fun with this dumb bullshit. Shang Tsung nodded. He would love to find a way to act against Raiden himself, but he dared not step into the circle to consult Shao Kahn. He didn't want to face the god's ire now that they knew the blundering idiot Kano was being followed, and by three members of the White Lotus Society, no, take two, and by three members of the White Lotus Society, no less. Men, women, and even children who were masters of the martial art and ninja arts. What? <laughs> Whatever. Even if he were to send Goro out to intercept them, that was no guarantee of victory. The giant Shokanite might have... Shokanite? Might have no trouble stopping one of the light, White Lotus Society members, but three? For that, Shang Tsung would need special assistance. Help that was sly and moved like the Hornet, quietly. And unseen. Where is he, Ruthe? Where is the only one who can help me? There was a long pause. I am looking. Then the disembodied voice rose. I see him. Shang Tsung, he is hiding. Where? In a cave, in a cliff, north of Wenzu. That's just like him, Shang Tsung said. With the fees he charges, he could live in splendor. Yet he chooses a life of hardship and study. And death, Ruthie said. Yes, death, Shang Tsung admitted. Okay, if I deepen him a little bit, he sounds less like Kung Lao. Don't be too harsh on him, Ruthie. Some people deserve to die. I will summon him. Wait! Be warned, Shang Tsung! He is cursed! Oh, this is Scorpion. Cursed? By who? Ruthie wailed. By the immortal you. That's why you. I don't want to. I don't want any confusion. And he's saying, you, as in you did it. You forgot. It's why you. Someone named you. Shang Tsung felt cold spiders crawl up his spine. The demigod you? Yes. He who is said to dwell in the underground caverns of Horse Ear Mountain, <laughs> which is sacred to the goddess Quan Lin. He who protects the canals and the tunnels. <coughs> this voice hurts. And looks after all who use them, human and animal. What did our br- Take two. 
What did our brash friend do to you? He killed a man, said Ruthe. What man? A toll taker. One who had given up a life of crime. One who had been a partner of man. You seek. And how did that crime come to the attention of the spirit of you? Shang Tsung asked. The man was killed, slowly disemboweled with a sword, while accomplices forced his wife and son to look on. After his murder, the man's remains were dumped into a canal. Shang Tsung raised an eyebrow. Is that all? I was expecting something truly terrible. I made him a little English there. <laughs> it was, Ruthe shrieked. When he disposed of the body in that way, he profaned one of the sacred waterways. Of you, Shang Tsung smiled now. Then he is definitely the man I want, he said. Anyone who is impudent enough to insult a demigod won't be afraid to attack a member of the White Lotus Society, or the gods who watch after them. I will send Hamachi, Rufe. When he nears his goal, see through his eyes and guide him. Yes, Shang Tsung. Who the fuck is Hamachi? Did Scorpion not have a real name yet? Or is it not Scorpion? I don't know what I'm talking about. Turning and leaving the room, the green and gold robes swirling around him, Shang Tsung went up the stone staircase to the highest room of the Southern Pagoda. Though anger was still hot on his features, at least he saw a way to protect Kano without having to give Shao Kahn another portion of his soul. Opening the door, the wizard pushed past the two hooded souls that were attending the many birds. That were attending to the many birds. That should say tending to the many birds in the palace aviary. The bulk of the collection of birds from around the world and their ornate cages of balsa and steel, of bamboo and ivory, of twigs and even string. He's fucking doing it again! Of and of, of and of, was for Shang Tsung's own enjoyment. He luxuriated in the specimens, which ranged from the common nightingale to the imposing pine gross beak, from the rufous-sided tauhi to the glorious yellow warbler, from the black vulture to the red-tailed hawk. But some of the birds were kept for more practical purposes. His falcons were trained to fly to the mainland and kill with claws of poison, while his beautiful white pigeons were trained to carry messages to spots all across eastern China. Going to a small writing table tucked in a corner of the stone chamber, Shang Tsung lit a candle, dipped a fountain pen in red ink, and wrote in small, tight characters on a slip of rice paper. Liu Kang and two other members of the White Lotus Society are camped to the west of Wuhu, headed east to intercept a band of black dragons. These interlopers must be stopped. You are my last hope. Fucking Obi-Wan. <laughs> Return the bird with a token so I will know that you have gone after them. Shang Tsung. After finishing the message, the sorcerer went over to one of the cages, carefully removed a pigeon, rolled the paper around its right leg, and fixed it there with a length of red string. Holding the bird in both hands, he made his way under and around many cages to the window. The black shutters of the window were closed, and one of the hooded servants scuttled over, released the hatch, and threw it open. Shang Tsung bent close to the bird and said softly, I know you won't fail me as my fellow humans have, devoted Hamachi. Okay, Hamachi's a fucking bird. Fly true and take my urgent message to the region you know well. Ruthe will see through your eyes and guide you from there. Then return to me, my delicate servant. Come back safely and soon, and I will offer up a human sacrifice to you. With a last look into the black pearl eyes of his precious, precious messenger, Shang Tsung threw the pigeon out the window and watched the bird bat its white wings until it was swallowed by the starlit sky. Fly, my precious. Fly! You who do not need the waterways, the tunnels, or the favor of the arrogant, you, to accomplish your mission. When the bird was gone, the magician turned slowly, walked across the black tiles of the corridor to his private chamber, dismissed the hooded attendant who offered him food and drink, and lay on his thick, satin pillows to await the dawn. As he stretched out and shut his eyes, tried to... What? As he stretched out and shut his tired eyes, tried to stop his exhausted mind from reviewing the long day's events, Ruthe's voice sounded inside his head. 
That's a fucked up sentence. Why is there, why is it? Never mind. Shang Tsung, you must come quickly. What is it? The wizard said tiredly. I see him. He awaits them. Who does? Who is trying to interfere with me now? Ruthay's voice screamed in his brain. Raiden! Raiden awaits! Shang Tsung was on his feet in an instant, racing toward the shrine, though he was exhausted from the long day of plotting and counterplotting. He would not, dared not, allow the god to stop him, even if it meant entering the circle and tapping the power of Shao Kahn himself. Holy shit. That's chapter 15, that's chapter 16, that's chapter 17. I think we're going to fucking read chapter 18. What do you think about that? <laughs> he dwelt in a cave 200 feet up the face of a cliff by the sea. The mouth of his home was barely wide enough to accommodate a slender adult. It was accessible only by climbing the sheer wall of rock a feat that was impossible for most mortals and daunting even to the few anarchids. <clears throat> Sorry, I thought they made up a word there. And was daunting even to the few arachnids and marsupials that tried it. Maybe some of them were even sent by you, he thought with a smirk. Who's he? I don't know what voice to do here. They didn't give me a voice to do here, so I'm just going to read it as me. Little assassins who would chastise me for having spilled blood in his present canal. The smirk faded as he thought back to the murder, the blood of a traitor, one who took the oath and then turned his back on us, one it had taken two decades to find. The traitor Yong Park had committed the ultimate... There's no comma there, so it doesn't read right. Let's, I'm going to insert a comma. The traitor Yong Park had committed the ultimate crime. Even if you himself crawled into the cave, he would find the killer unrepentant and willing to kill the former ninja again. This whole fucking, this whole thing is written f terribly. The cave was located 200 miles south of Shimura Island, though it was still hours before dawn when the pigeon reached it. Landing in the narrow mouth, the bird cooed once then stood still, as it had been trained to do. The ninja was awake and beside it in an instant, crouching beneath a ceiling that didn't allow for him to stand. Dressed only in a white loincloth, despite the cold floor and chill air in the cave, he was reading the message by moonlight a moment later. A smile crossed his lips, lips so pale and clay-like that they appeared dead. His small, very narrow eyes looked from the message to the bird, to the moonlight, that lit just the entrance of his dark abode. He rang the back... Take two, I fucked up. He ran the back of an index finger up and down the bird's breast. Good, Hamachi. I still don't know what voice to do here. They haven't told me who this is. Return to your master the, so that he will know I have received his message and I'm on my way to do his bidding. For a price, of course, he said. He glanced at the several pyramid-shaped stacks of scrolls in the rear of the cave. His fee was another manuscript from Shang Tsung's library. One of the many scrolls that were centuries old, dating back to the dawn of the days of the first ninjutsu, and containing arcane secrets of the League of Assassins, to which he belonged, the widely feared Lin Kuei. Hey, it's fucking Sub-Zero! <laughs> so now I need to come up with a voice for Sub-Zero. He tingled with pride and burned with fresh hatred for Yong Hark, as he thought of the rich history of the breed to which he belonged. Formed in AD 1200, the ninjutsu were entrusted with the protection of shoguns in ancient Japan. The Lin Kuei was a breed of ninja that moved from Japan to China in 1310. They would kidnap children when they were 5 or 6 years old and raise them in secret caves or woods to become superb athletes, great scholars, and unparalleled fighters, able to use all weapons and improvise arms from common objects such as paper rolled knife to a knife point or sand packed into a sock. They would train the children, boys and girls both, to be masters of many trades, carpenters, fishermen, priests, and even beggars, so they could blend in and make themselves useful in different towns as they traveled on missions for their lords. Many young people died during training. Some could not hold their breath for five minutes and were drowned. Others weren't fast enough to avoid the weapons of the masters. Some starved or froze on dehydrated... Take two. Some starved or froze or dehydrated when they were stranded, naked, in deserts, or on mountaintops to, told to make their way home. 
But those were survived. These two fuck ups were, I mean. But those who survived were the Lin Kuei. Removing the string from a scroll Shang Tsung had long ago given him in payment, the ninja placed it in the bird's beak, gently turned the white pigeon around, and coaxed it into the night. Then the ninja crept toward a chest in a far corner of the cave, a chest that he had carried up here on his back, a chest containing all of his worldly belongings, the tools of his trade. He opened the chest and began removing what he would need for his mission. He pulled on the black tights and cowl that would keep him warm and enable him to move in shadow. He donned the silver mask that covered his face and throat and protected him from harm. Silver? He put on the white belt white belt? and billowing vest that enabled him to glide if necessary for short distances. He donned shoes that had pockets of air which, when inflated, temporarily enabled him to walk on water and he strapped on armor that covered his forearms and the backs of his hand, silver plates that allowed him to reach deep into the dead soul and generate waves of cold that temporarily froze his opponents. So Sub-Zero doesn't wear any blue? (laughs) Just silver and white? Inside his belt, in specifically sewn pockets, he concealed a pair of Kyokutsu shogs, knives that that attached to a... I'm going to own that one. Knives attached each to a length of nylon cord, smoke bombs and vials of poison, a breathing tube for traveling underwater, and firecrackers to create distractions. Around his wrists he donned hooks which he would use to impale enemies or climb sheer rock, and across his back he slung a length of chain and a long staff, in the hollow end of which was a knife. Despite his many accoutrements, the ninja was able to move with ease and secrecy, Slipping back and toward the mouth of the cave, the feared and, en- and enig- the feared and enigmatic Sub-Zero crept out and made his way quickly down the face of the cliff to the beach below. As he reached the shore, the still standing, I'm the- these are all on me. I'm- <laughs> In full disclosure, it's 2:51 a.m. and uh, I'm a little tired. <laughs> As he reached the shore, still standing in the deepest shadows by the cave, he experienced something he had never felt before. A sense of dread. It didn't come from the job he'd been asked to do, or the place he was serving as his temporary home. It came from something out there. Something he couldn't quite see or hear, but something he could feel. But part of his ninja training since early childhood had been the overcoming of fear through rational sublimination. He took a moment to remind himself that the worst thing that could happen was not to die, but to die with dishonor. That would never happen, and since it would not, there was nothing for him to fear. Able to push the dread to a place where it didn't bother him, wouldn't interfere with his performance, the agile Sub-Zero ran along the silvery, moonlit sands to the path that led the woods and hills below Woohoo. Dan Dans, that's four chapters right there. 15, 16, 17, 18. We have made it all the way up to page 153. I committed, as soon as I started this book, to finishing this book. And we did about half of it on season one of Mortal Kombat Monday, and I think we should do the second half here on Mortal Kombat Monday season two. If you want to continue hearing me read this book you gotta let me know down in the comments if you don't want me to continue reading this book let me tell you something just don't click on the episodes where i'm reading the goddamn book because i've already promised a lot of people that i'm gonna finish so i hope those of you who are new to this concept enjoy it it's just stupid fun but until next week i love you and i will see you then